man, because there's nothing more fun than grabbing somebody off the side of the road and showing them Saturn's rings for the first time. So if you haven't visited Black Rock Observatory, please come see us at 3 o'clock and G. We have a ridiculous 20-inch mirror telescope, uh, some incredible solar observing equipment, um, like I said, a meteorite museum, some speakers at Space Talks, and uh, yeah, this is our 10-year anniversary. We've been doing 10 years of astronomy at Burning Man. Um, and there are some of those things uh, hanging out in the alcoves here. What do we have? Meteorite Museum, an astrophoto booth, some solar observing is going to pop out. That would be outside, in the sun, of course. Um, and we have astronomy readings with our astronomy tarot deck. Okay, so I'm going to jump into this panel. I have an incredible panel of space experts here. Uh, or at least some last minute burners that I found who, who are really good at pretending they know about space. Um, here, so from the Black Rock Observatory, I have myself, uh, Katie Carolyn, uh, Dr. David Reitzel, and then our esteemed guest, uh, uh, Dr. Moosh, and Charles White, who was involved in the founding of BRO uh, ten, over 10 years ago. Um, yeah, so we're gonna, one thing that we found is really fun, uh, one thing we get at the observatory a lot is a lot of space questions. And something we found is really fun to do is just kind of a panel to open it up to all of you out in the audience who have questions about space that need answers. Uh, this is an incredibly knowledgeable group of people up here, uh, but they are also burners first, so they're just like you and me, and they are happy to answer any of your questions with enthusiasm and all of that. Uh, so what we're going to do, I'm going to start off with a question, a little bio, and maybe a question for each of our panelists, and then we're going to hand out the mic to the audience so anybody can ask. Um, is there anything else from the rest of the bro in the audience that I am missing? You're good. Yes, we have, where is the Meteorite Museum? The Meteorite Museum right over there, uh, towards the 3 o'clock side. And the solar observing, do you know where that is? Right outside there, just keep walking. Um, the, solar, the sun is at a solar maximum activity right now and it is really cool. We were watching a, a solar ejecta come off the surface yesterday over several hours, it was really awesome. So I definitely recommend taking a look at the solar scope. Um, yeah, so let me introduce myself and the panelists. So my name is Robin. I am part of Black Rock Observatory. I've been burning since 2014 and uh, my first degree was in astronomy, but then I turned my cloak and did my PhD in particle physics at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so I'm going to be moderating the panel, but if any questions come in about high energy physics or neutrinos or cosmic rays, maybe I'll field a couple of those. Um, next we have Dr. David Reitzel, who is an astronomer at the Griffith Observatory in LA and has been burning since 1998. Uh, he fell in love with astronomy camping in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, in his PhD, he studied galaxy formations and the Andromeda galaxy in particular. Uh, over to my left, I have Katie Carolyn, who is an astronomer and helps run the nightly public observing program at Griffith Observatory as well. Uh, after receiving her degree in astronomy from USC in 2022, she started an event business that focuses on delivering innovative and engaging astronomy science communication with the public. She is also the telescope lead at the Black Rock Observatory. And thank you so much for all your hard work, Katie. Now we have Moosh, or Dr. Moosh, who's a planetary scientist. He grew up in Reno, but only learned about Burning Man from other scientist burners. Uh, this is his second burn. He studied the oceans inside icy moons in our solar system of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, using magnetic fields, and now works at high tech, uh, works on high-tech industrial problem solving. Um, and last, uh, Charles White worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab Laboratory for 37 years where he served as Deputy Chief Knowledge Officer and a Lessons Learned Investigator. He was also involved in the founding of the Black Rock Observatory over a decade ago. All right, uh, thanks everybody. So I'm gonna just start off with one question of my own. Uh, please feel free to answer for a couple minutes, share a bit about yourself, uh, your work, and your knowledge about uh, this field, and about a bit about your burning history if you want. So I'm gonna start with I'm going to start with Doc, if you're ready. Uh, so, oh no, no mic. Yeah, good one. Okay. Uh, so, Doc, you did a lot of uh, public observing uh, events at the Griffith Observatory. So, 
you must keep up to date on a lot of the space news. And I'm curious, what is uh, some astronomical event coming up that you are most excited about? Well, the thing I'm most excited about isn't right around the corner, actually, but it's in 2027. There is an eclipse, total solar eclipse of the sun, that passes through Luxor, Egypt. Now to see it, you need to be in this narrow path of totality to have the moon pass directly in front of the sun and it's going right through there. So this will be a spectacular opportunity to travel there, make your plans now. I'm telling you now because people plan years in advance. So this is one of the coolest things in my lifetime that's happening. Total solar eclipse. Amazing, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited for that. I saw an eclipse in 2017 and then another one a few months ago and I'm definitely going to Luxor for this one. Maybe we can bring the observatory there as well. All right, uh, next, Katie. Um, we were talking a little bit about the moon yesterday. Uh, we had the telescope tracked on the moon and we have a couple actual uh, samples of moon rock from lunar meteorites, which I think we might have over there if you want to check them out. Uh, could you tell me a bit about the face in the moon? I would like to thank you, Robin. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Katie. Hi Katie. Um, uh, I've been the lead for Black Rock Observatory for the telescopes for the last two years, and I'm having the most fun of my whole life getting to be with this wonderful crew of people, and I'm just really grateful to be here. The face in the moon, which you can see during the day, and the moon is up right now, uh, and also at night, that these are ancient lava flows on the moon from four billion years ago, right when it was still in its formation stage where it was still molten inside now it's just a big cold rock um, but when it was molten inside it was able to have some lava flows but not from the normal activity like volcanoes like we have on earth um, there was this incredible moment in the formation of the solar system called the late heavy bombardment which is just an epic name as well where all these large chunks of rock from the outer solar system came in and bombarded the inner solar system and they hit the back side of the moon so hard that the front side that we see ripped open um, and lava flowed out and this only happened for a brief period of time and the moon promptly cooled all the way through and then we just see the remnants of that period of activity from long ago because not much has happened on the moon since then. I mean, we visited there, so that was pretty cool. But uh, besides that, it's just gotten a lot more craters, but there isn't any geologic activity or weather activity or erosion like we have on Earth that resurfaces the moon. And so we see these marks of the past of its formation every time we look at the moon, and I think that's pretty cool. Amazing face, Katie. And also, so we hear uh, say that there's a face in the moon, but you were also telling me in different cultures they see different things. Yes, yeah, so um, the Chinese see a dragon in the moon, and the Japanese see a bunny in the moon. I personally see a bunny more than I see a face, just so you know. So you can, you know, just like how you look at clouds and you can form different shapes with the clouds, you should try to do that with the moon and try to connect the splotches in your own way. Um, amazing, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, moving on to Moosh. A question I have, so you work on uh, on icy moons and with oceans, and there is some talk about you know, potential conditions for life there. And so I'm sure we'll talk about that more later on, but I, my first question is, with all this looking, why haven't we found life beyond our Earth yet? Well, it's hard to find. And the surfaces of all the other bodies in the solar system are exposed to either space or they're baked like Venus, and it's hard to find anything that would stick around if life were there. So it's even though it's not for want of looking, we've been looking in, in many different ways, many different places, but um, it's hard to find anything that, that actually would stick out. And, and these oceans in the icy moons, they're hard to get to. So we haven't been able to get into any of the oceans yet. Um, that's something that we may see in our lifetime, but it'll be quite a long ways off. And then looking beyond our solar system, the um, speed of light is actually pretty slow in the scheme of the, the scale of the universe. So it takes a long time for the light to get between us and other places. So we're only able to see what is nearby us very well. And if there are 
life forms farther away, we may just have not found them yet because the signals that they're sending are too weak. So it's, I mean, it's just hard to find the life that is there, but I mean, we'll find it eventually. It's just may not be in our lifetimes. We don't know yet. It could be tomorrow. Fair enough, yeah, and like you said, it's not for lack of looking. There's so many programs out there uh, looking for signs of life, habitable planets, uh, radio signals. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole field of astrobiology, which is funny because there's not any actual biology there yet, but we're figuring out what it could look like, right? That's true, but also biological principles are important to know what to look for. Exactly. So biologists are on the task, we just haven't found any biology beyond yeah. our own that we brought there. Yeah, it's one of the coolest fields, I think. It's just, it's such an interesting endeavor. Um, okay, yeah, thank you so much for answering some of my questions. I think we can open it up to audience questions if anybody has burning questions about space. Oh, God. I'm so, so, <laughs> I'm just so excited. Last but not least, Charles White. Um, they got this one. All right, we'll go with this one. <laughs> okay, what about me, man? Yeah, what, what about, about Charles? What about Charles? So, you have one of the coolest jobs I've heard of. Uh, so, you were the Deputy Chief Knowledge Officer and Lessons Learned Investigator at NASA JPL for a very long time. Um, and so, my first obvious question is, what the heck does that mean? What is a Lessons Learned <laughs> Officer? What is a Knowledge Officer? Or, Lessons Learned Investigator? What is a Knowledge Officer? Well, and in, our, in a bit of our chat, you talked about some of your work on the Mars rover wheels. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that as an example. Yeah, I guess the Mars rover wheels. I put art cars on Mars. So. <laughs> I've been on all the uh, 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 rover missions in one various capacity or another. Um, as far as what I see in the moon, I see the Native American in the moon you know, with the two feathers leaning over a fire. And uh, as far as life on Europa, I, I'm not so worried about life on Europa. I want to know what it tastes like. So, <laughs> sushi from Europa is kind of awesome. Been a while. <laughs> uh, so a knowledge officer, what the heck is that? Um, JPL has a high success ratio of missions on, uh, on putting rovers on Mars. And the reason we have that is because we have a knowledge management program. And it's really kind of funny because if you're in computers, you deal with hardware, but the concept of software had to be explained. So knowledge management, the same thing. We have brains, but knowledge is the software that we have. So how do we transfer that to other people and how do we move that along? Because it's, a, it's kind of a soft skill and it sometimes involves uh, chicken and feathers and magic, you know, in order to do. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and peanuts, lucky peanuts, yeah. Uh, so as a knowledge officer, I would come up with programs that would facilitate sharing of information. What are we doing right now? This is a knowledge management activity. So uh, I would host symposiums and talks and all of that. But, but the knowledge investigator part, uh, the lesson learned investigator, that was really cool. Uh, because as you know, curiosity started getting holes in the wheels of the rover, right? So why? Why was that happening? So we built a, uh, a, a mirror image of the rover on Earth and a mirror image of the same type of rocks on Earth. And we ran the, uh, a brand new set of rover wheels around you know, like eight kilometers, and lo and behold, the exact same damage occurred on the rover wheels. So they, so they did a, a, you know, we have a, an FRB and an MIB. You know what the MIB is, right? The men in black is the MIB. It actually stands for Mishap Investigation Board, and FRB is a Failure Review Board. They report to me their findings, and then I write the lesson learned for the, what it all entailed. And as a result of that, we made the new Perseverance wheels much stronger. Now we couldn't change the weight of the wheel because it had to match the same launch capabilities. So what we did is we learned that we could make the wheel a little narrower and then take that extra aluminum and add it to the thickness of the wheel. And we also changed the grousers or the tread you would call it and we changed the function of that to make it stronger. So now Perseverance wheels 
are rolling along. Thank you to my lessons learned. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So that's what a knowledge officer does. Amazing. Thanks, Charles. Thanks for making a nice, strong art car up on the <laughs> Okay. Now, again, we can try that again. Uh, if anybody has uh, had their curiosity peaked and has some questions about space or follow-ups about anything that we've chatted about here, uh, just raise your hand and we will have a wireless mic run right to you. And if oh. you have any questions about uh, magnetized polyimide kapton tape, I'd be happy to talk to you about that one because that was, that was the most technical yet most simple of a strange lesson learning that we have. Kapton tape is like the sc scotch tape we use on spacecraft. All right, maybe we can uh, get into space tape in a second. Uh, we've got a yeah. question over here. In, uh, beautiful shape. Hello? Testing? Oh. Is that higher? Uh -oh. It's coming from Sam. This guy's a, a space author, so here oh, we go. Fun. I know something, but a uh, question for you about humans in space. Especially about things like radiation. Has there been any progress in research on how to manage the effects of radiation upon humans in space? So the question was, has there been any progress on how to manage the effects of radiation on humans in space? Which is very important uh, if we want to be traveling any farther than the moon. I'm, I'm a robotics guy. I don't believe in sending humans to space. So. <laughs> one of my uh, one of my qu viral quotes on LinkedIn was, by the time humans will get to Mars, they will step foot in a lobby. Ah. All right. It should be built by Android. Yeah. Uh, Doc, do you have a follow Yeah, on? I, I follow it a little bit since I'm kind of a generalist now that I'm at Griffith Observatory. I, I know that they're looking into ways to try and get humans places faster. The shielding is very heavy. You can do things like water, fuel, lead but you need to get all that off the earth. We're in a deep potential well. But if you can get humans there faster, if you don't take the this, this most economical way, then you don't have to worry as much about the shielding. But the problem still is when you get to Mars, the atmosphere is so thin, you're not stopping the cosmic rays there. So you need to build a structure with robots, Charles is saying, so you walk into the lobby. That, in, in my opinion, is the safe way to do it. I was actually in a meeting where they were talking about the mass requirements and now that Star, Starship and SpaceX is launching massive amounts, we were like, do we have to change our design principles and our flight project practices? Because all of a sudden, weight is not an option, I mean, not a concept now. So so that that's going to be a factor too. Yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah. Come on, Sam. Sam. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> No. One more try. Now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I uh, I'm in charge of a small tech company. It's my company called Quark Tech. And I what we do is we work on SI, synthetic intelligence, and artificial intelligence. I'm wondering the robots you were talking about. Yeah. Um, are you designing them more as an SI, synthetic intelligence, or just an AI? There's um, a big difference. There is. And if you, I'm retired, so I can say this now. If you go to charles-ai.com, I was doing AI four years before I retired, and everyone was laughing at me. I was one of those guys. But now that I'm retired, I'm flying all over the world talking about AI, so I understand why you're doing it. Yeah, the concept is, is it's evolving so fast. By the time we're ready to put the androids up there, it's going to be all the AI. It, it literally is. It's going to be all the intelligences that we're looking at with, with huge databases to draw on. So, uh, so yeah, it's, well, we're not ready. We're nowhere near ready of getting real androids like that. What is the difference between the two? Yeah, what is the difference between the two? Because I don't know. Could I? Yeah, I, I mean, from what I understand, it worked a little Can we have our participant? Yeah. yeah. Would you like to share? Since it's your Please. company. Thank you so much. In my understanding, an AI is more like a dumb robot. It's more like it's more like a, a smart computer, but without the without the wherewithal, without the um, what's the word consciousness, reasoning and self, yeah, context, uh, right? Well, uh, self awareness. Yeah. They do not have it. An SI, a synthetic intelligence, is more like data yeah. from Star Trek, and they are working on it right now. 
the U.S. government has been researching it. I've talked with former intel officers who've been doing this. So that's the difference. I'm also looking for funding to continue my research. <laughs> so I can get funding. Let's talk after. Yeah. We can talk after I personally do not. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, hello, Gary, nice to see you. Do you have a question about space? Okay, we'll keep thinking. Um, anybody else? Oh, got a hand over here. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes. Uh, cool. Uh, so this is a question for anyone on the panel. Are there any strong open questions about space or just how the universe operates that are incommensurate with our current understanding that you know we're interested in exploring and like finding out more about? Yeah. Great question. So, so if I understand, are there any open questions about space that, uh, or in space and physics that really go against our current understanding? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes, totally. That is why this is still such an active field of research. Um, if there were like easy, boring questions, I don't think that would be as exciting for the scientists. Um, one of the big ones is dark energy. Another one is dark matter. They have a similar name just because they're both currently totally not understood by us. Uh, the dark is like dark to our understanding. Um, also, dark to our tools and instruments that we use in general to study space. So dark energy um, is a, a this unknown source of expansion to the universe. So what we understand with the laws of physics um, are, and like the fundamental forces is that gravity should be pulling everything inwards but we see that there is an overall expansion to the whole universe pushing outwards against gravity. And that goes against our current understanding of what the laws of the universe and the forces of the universe are. We do not know what that is. We have uh, any, any guesses that we've had, um, like looking at the vacuum energy due to quantum mechanics, maybe that has some outward pressure and the, the estimates uh, that that could produce are totally off, so that's just like definitely not the right answer. So we've had ideas of what it could be, and we still don't know what it is. It's very mysterious. Also, dark matter, we know that all of the particles that make up the matter that we see do interact with light in some way. And so astronomy, for the most part, is using all the different types of light that are being emitted by all the different things in the universe. Um, so we also use a little bit of gravitational waves now that's not using normal light. Uh, we also use high energy particles that are flying in from outer space and we look at their signature, so that's not exactly light, but that's all we got, pretty much. And when we look out and measure how much matter there is out in the universe, we end up measuring more than we can see. We end up measuring about five times more matter than uh, we can actually identify. And so we call this missing matter dark matter. And we have tested a lot of different theories of what it could be, and it hasn't been any of those. And so we don't know what it is yet. And it could also possibly be a modified a theory or gravity, but we don't know yet. All right, yeah, very good. Uh, if I could throw one more in there, uh, kind of through my work with particle physics, the standard model of particle physics describes things on the small level very, very, very well. And then the theory, the Einstein theory of gravity, describes things on large scales very, very, very well. And they do not play nicely together at all. Uh, so one of the big things we're trying to figure out is some quantum theory of gravity or some kind of matching standard model forces and gravitational forces. So there's another one. Yeah. Um, can I, I, I'm gonna jump in with a question to Moosh, because I've been thinking, I really want to, somebody asked this, but I'm gonna ask it now. What's the biggest ocean in the solar system, and what's it made of, and how do we know? That is a tricky question, because we don't know the specs on most of the oceans in the solar system. We know Europa has about twice as much water overall as Earth. Like, that's a, that's a grab bag fact that I have. Like, all the water in all the oceans on Earth, you put that on a smaller body, the size of our own moon. Europe is about the, the size of our own moon and you have the ocean that's on Europa, but it's still got a thick ice shell on top, and like we can't see what's down underneath. But 
another moon that has even more water, but we don't know what state it's in, whether it's ice or whether it's liquid, is Ganymede, which is the next moon over in Jupiter's orbit. And many other icy moons also have lots of water. We don't know the exact amount of each because we don't know how the layers play out because it's hard to, to figure out what's beneath the surface that you can't see. On Earth, we use seismic waves. We use magnetic fields, which is what my research was about, um, to be able to tell what's underneath our feet. But we pretty much just have gravity and, and, and uh, magnetic fields for these bodies. And we need a lot more data than we have to be able to figure out what's going on inside these, these moons. Uh, but Ganymede almost certainly will have more liquid just because it has so much more water and uh, it's likely to be a liquid water ocean uh, that's pretty thick. So I don't know how, like how many times bigger than Earth's it would be, but it's probably going to be real salty just like ours is. It helps keep the, the water liquid for uh, colder temperatures and uh, longer periods of time. But many moons in, in throughout the outer solar system, like pretty much everything except Io, has just got lots and lots of water. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's awesome. So yeah, maybe maybe soup for life uh, at some point. Very likely. Yeah. If you got water and it's sitting against the rock, like you're gonna you're gonna dissolve compounds from the rocks into the water that life can potentially use. And we don't know how life got started on Earth, but it's very reasonable that the same conditions could exist uh, now or in the past on. Uh, other bodies, especially in the oceans of some of these icy moons. Wow, oh, amazing. Thank you. All right, now uh, now back to the audience. Thank you for giving me the moment to that. Uh, I think there were some hands over here. Yeah? More of a current events question. Are you guys keeping an eye on the Northern Crown constellation in case the Night Star does its thing? Have you sent up a flare so we can tell yeah. some people about that? <laughs> Yeah. I think we got asked this yeah, yesterday. I can, so. I, can, I can cover that one. What, what he's talking about is in the Corona Borealis, which is the northern crown constellation, there is a star that is too faint to see with your naked eye right now, but it is about to go what we call Nova. It has a companion star that's been dumping material onto a white dwarf. It's eventually going to heat up enough to ignite in nuclear fusion, and it'll get very bright, bright enough for us to see with the naked eye, at least out here at Burning Man, if, we're, if I'm back in LA, maybe. Um, probably about as bright as Polaris, the North, North Star, and it could happen at any moment. So, and it's periodic, it happens every 80, Katie, do you remember how many? 86, 86 years, yeah, something like that. And we're in the 86th year right now, so keep an eye on it. Um, if it happens, we'll tell BMIR, that this went off. Um, we'll make sure we get word to them, so check uh, Burning Man Information Radio, and uh, come out to Black Rock Observatory and look at the sky with us, and that's the best way to check, is just to come to the observatory. So, great question. Yeah, that's, that's right, we're gonna have a big line then. Yeah, we, we sure will. Yeah, but it's amazing to have a new star appear in the sky that'll fade over a period of, yeah, like just a couple of weeks, it'll be visible to the naked eye. So if you hear it in the news, get to a spot to go see it, because it's this is cool. And it is supposed to happen by September. So for the last many months, some people have been seeing it in the news, keep an eye out, and it, it is due like right now. So not to over hype it, but I'm really I'm really hoping it really happens while we're here. Stay tuned to be a monarch ninety-four point five. Black Rock Observatory broadcast. <laughs> so to be clear, this is slightly, uh, very different than a supernova, which is extremely bright and violent and uh, and and takes a lot longer. So like, uh, for instance, Betelgeuse is the the upper shoulder of Orion is a very orange, red hypergiant that's about to go supernova, but that about means it could happen tomorrow, it could happen in a million years. Uh, the long, stellar evolution is the longest. Okay, uh, next question. I see a hand up with the gentleman in the hat there. Thanks, Dad. This is my dad, by the way. Yeah. Love you, Dad. Yeah. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Zoom. Where's Zoom? He's zooming around. This is too technical. I understand there's two mechanisms for calculating the Hubble constant, and they don't agree with each other. Any ideas? Uh, yeah, I sure do. Um, they might agree with one another. There was just a new paper that came out from the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, where they remeasured it, and the number it found was right in between the two. What he's talking about is that expansion rate of the universe, how fast the galaxies appear to be moving away from us. 
we can use one method where we use rather local galaxies. We look for supernova explosions, white dwarfs that actually have gone past what they can support. They explode as a supernova, called a type 1a supernova explosion. By the way, this little nova might do that someday if it happens enough to it, but it's not going to do it now. Um, anyway, the, so that's one method. We can use that as a distance indicator and then say that galaxy is moving this fast and we can map out that speed. Things further away are moving faster, things closer are moving slower, but that's only good locally. It doesn't work super far away because the, the explosions are too faint. Then you can use the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the afterglow from the Big Bang itself. And physics, all our physics equations, everything we understand, says that pattern in there that is in this background that we measure using radio waves, microwaves, um, the Planck Space Telescope went up there, the Planck measurement. Anyway, very, very accurate measurements, and they get a value that comes out like, if I remember it, 68, 69, something like that. And when you use the local galaxies, they were getting a number closer to 73. So those numbers were don't seem that different, but the error bars on each of them did not overlap. They both felt they were accurate and say, no, we're right here, we're right there. So we were thinking maybe it's changed, maybe something's happening. Stay tuned, new observations are revealing that those Hubble measurements of the nearby galaxies may have had companion stars next to them, polluting the measurements, confusing what we were measuring. And Webb, with its higher resolution and its capability to see finer detail, may be able to resolve some of this. So I'm hoping the two get resolved, but literally I saw this, while I was out on Playa, this is that new of news. So I don't I don't have it fully digested yet, but that's what he's talking about. And it's a weird thing. It's one of those things that we're studying, trying to figure out, one of those exciting things that was a, a, a miss in our understanding of the universe. So great, wonderful question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I see a hand almost up. Yeah, there you go. You committed. Next, all right. Hello. Um, is Lunar Gateway going to launch on time? Is the Artemis program on schedule? And if not, how far behind is it? <laughs> Those are, you, you ask about uh, last class of space flight. Uh, I gave a lecture in Iceland that it should be up right about now. Uh, but yeah, no. Uh, everything gets delayed and delayed and delayed. It's kind of like Trump's lawsuits. It's the same thing. Uh, so, uh, but for those who don't know what the Lunar Gateway is, that mind if I tell them about that? Please. Lunar Gateway is, everybody knows that we have the ISS, the International Space Station. Lunar Gateway is we're going to build a, a, a space station orbiting the moon. And that's going to act as the supply stop for, uh, for the missions going to the moon. So what they'll do, it's instead of going from Earth and you know, separating from the lunar, uh, from the orbital module and the lunar module lands, and then they come back up. It'll be acting the same way as the command module up there, except we'll be building it piece by piece, and that's going to be the gateway. It's going to be the space station. So yeah, that's a, a it, an immensely awesome. I, I get so excited when I talk about the lunar gateway because it's like, the wow. The, <laughs> the call is save the ISS. Save the ISS. <laughs> I want to see it splash. <laughs> do I want to do I want to save it? I feel like it's had its moment and it's kind of old and we could start a new one around the moon. Commercialize it. Don't just yeah, you're saying like don't scrap it, like sell it used. Hotel. Expensive hotel. <laughs> Expensive hotel. Maybe we should maybe we should vote on it now. We should decide the fate of the ISS on the panel. Actually, uh, uh, ISS uh, raise your hand if you want the ISS to splash. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Now it's doomed. Yeah, it's doomed. Just sell it off. Yeah. So uh, when the space shuttles were flying, I'm a lessons learned guy, right? We learn lessons learned. My Bible was the Challenger and the Columbia Report on my whiteboard. And whenever someone came into my office and they would start, oh, I wanna do this, I said, oh, ex excuse me, let me just pull this off. Let's look at page 155. Let's look at this. The shuttles had to end because there were more incidents than just the killing of 14 human astronauts. 
which is, but if you did, this is strong to me, I might cry. That patch. If you look at that patch, it's a tribute and a memorial to all the astronauts, including Apollo 1. So when we say it needs to splash, it's not coming from an emotional place. Emotionally flag-waving USA, go shuttle, go shuttle. But from a technical standpoint, they needed to come down. And it needed to come down before Columbia. So that's just my statement on that. Don't let emotions. We have a condition called um, push to launch or launch fever. Where you, where you spend so many times working on an item on a pad that you just say, oh, just press the button. Well, no. Yeah. It, you have to have that Spock-like, unemotional detachment when it comes to human spaceflight and spaceflight. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All good. All good. Very, yeah, important lessons to hear. Um, I think you were next with the questions. You hit my thank you. <laughs> Love silly questions. ISS. I saw a beacon out there last night. It was very bright. It seemed to shoot up all the way in the sky. And I was wondering, what would that be visible like from space? Like, how visible is Burning Man? How visible is that beacon you know, from like the ISS or something? Quite a bit. Yeah, the, the big laser. That's a good question. Anyone know how, like, is it quite a bit that Burning Man is visible from space, or oh, that yeah, the, oh, yeah. the laser is visible yeah. from space? Uh, it's it's quite a bit. You can you can see a lot of details. It's two hundred some miles up, but the air is totally clear. You know, the sky, the scene is very clear, straight up. So when the astronauts fly over Burning Man, they'll see all the LED camps and all that stuff. And if there's a really bright laser that just happens to hit them, yeah, they can see a flash, but. Uh, the line site later is probably not, but they'll, they'll see the actual city of Burning Man. There's also, this uh, reminds me of, uh, anybody want to talk about the retro reflector on the moon? Yeah. Oh. Also, oh, the ISS, the ISS does fly over multiple times a night, and I was checking on its location. We can't, we can only see it when it's being lit up by the sun in like post-sunset or pre-dawn, so there aren't any super good passes where we would see it, but they would totally see us very clearly. They go over around like four in the morning-ish. Make sure to wave. Um, and it doesn't a quick, yeah, Just it does a quick wave. side note that that reminded me of, there's a, a very clear way to deny any uh, moon landing deniers. There is, they installed, I think on Apollo 17 or one of the Apollo missions, they installed a big retroreflector mirror on the moon. So if you point a very powerful laser at the moon, at that particular reflector, you can get a reflection back, which you wouldn't get just pointing at the moon anyway. So there's very clear visible stuff on the moon that you can see from super Earth. So maybe my own warrior will hit it. That'd be fun. Look, that big laser did get right in front of Andromeda at the end of observing last boo. night. So I was, boo. yeah, boo, boo to the big laser, but it's okay. Um, I see a question over here, too, and then another one. Uh, yeah. Assuming current funding rates, what would each of you change or not change about the ISS in five-year budget? That's a good question. So, given current funding rates, what do you change or not change about NASA's five-year budget? Ish. Question. Anything that you like really want to see happen? I don't know. You really think is not a good idea. Well, I I don't have a super strong opinion, but I do like the Chandra X-ray Observatory. I would like to keep it around a little bit longer, but I do understand that like you need to sometimes get rid of the old tech so that you can call for a replacement. But I don't know. I wish we could keep it while keep it running while we waited for the next one. Because I think it's really cool. I think X-ray observing is really cool. Absolutely. I, I'm curious what Mish has to say. Let's see. More money for science. <laughs> All right. Less human space flight and more money for important infrastructure type things that are just getting neglected. There's not a lot of reward systems in place for things like sh open sharing of software. So that's something that's just a, a thorn in the side of, of many scientists trying to just do their work. But there really just is not enough funding to do all the science that we need to with the data we already have, even. Uh, much less trying to plan well for future missions and, and where we might be gathering data in the future and knowing what data to gather. Like There's a, a, a large deficit in the amount of funding that, that is needed to do the research that is not being done. Um, to, to 
kind of parlay off of that. Indeed, we have a lot of folks that are trained to do science. Um, we have a large number of postdoctoral researchers at JPL, at universities, at observatories, but there aren't nearly enough research positions for them from that point on. Now, they benefit, um, you know, they benefit our society because they go into business, they can do innovation there, but we have so much data and the rate we're accumulating data is increasing. Um, they're building telescopes that are 30 meters across and a little larger for the extremely large, the European extremely large telescope. Those telescopes are gonna generate enormous amounts of data. There are survey telescopes. So some of this artificial intelligence that will help, but people are needed in these roles. And if you don't fund those, the information is lost. It kind of goes back to what Charles did. You need to have this, a, a large number of people and they need careers to be able to tell the younger people the information and teach it. There's just too much to know. So we need more people in the, in the chain. I, I'd add more people. I would say uh, education uh, at the same time. Uh, you know, the thing is about when you say NASA funding, that's your taxpayers. That's unconsensual donations we're taking from you. And so when we talk about open source projects and things like that, there's a lot of legislation that gets in the way about where we can spend money. So we need to spend money to kind of loosen up and, and improve our agility. Agility is the key right now because if you look at like NASA and how we've been working on spacecraft, NASA's made a change. Instead of building our own spacecraft, we're now licensing uh, spacecraft and we're riding, uh, we're, we're, we're calling Ubers, in this case SpaceX. But we need, we need more Ubers, we need more in the commercial space uh, exploration program. And again, uh, Androids. We need SI and AI and all those, uh, uh, you know, uh, androids. Uh, because I tell you, you know, when the first people start dying uh, on Mars, the human public do not have a taste for that. Uh, we had some faster, better, cheaper uh, era. And the whole idea was to send a, a $200,000 spacecraft versus a $4 billion spacecraft. And the lesson we learned was the public doesn't care. It's the same. You lost a spacecraft. And so we couldn't keep sending cheap spacecrafts because with, that were riskier because the public did not accept the risk. So thus, we need more money in education of the public. We need more money to educate the GOP. We need to educate the congressmen. And right now, they, they get their funding based on their districts because that money comes in. But we need to get people to look at the greater good and think higher and to reach that mythic Star Trek goal of to go where no one is going. All right. Thank you. Yes. I have a question for you, Charles. Being so aware of the risk to human lives and advocating for greater safety what do you feel about the human deep desire to go explore and send people out there? Do you think we should still be doing that? Just make sure it's super, super safe? Or what do you feel about that? I got to spend 90 minutes face to face with Carl Sagan. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna echo what Carl Sagan says. It is our destiny to go. It is our yearning. But maybe now is not the right time. Maybe we need to wait. Maybe that's the mature thing to do. But when we're ready, we need to go. Carl Sagan. I also want to share a hot take of mine, and that is that in our lifetimes, we're not going to see anybody come back from Mars alive. I think we might see a one-way trip, but it just takes too much infrastructure to be able to launch all the mass you would need to protect astronauts adequately to, to stave off cancer and things that'll happen from this, just the space environment and radiation. And that applies to in transit as well as on the surface of Mars. You can protect people in caves or whatever you want to do on the surface, but it, while they're on their eight month-ish journey that it's going to take to get there, they're going to be bombarded by all kinds of radiation. And to shield from that just requires too much cooperation internationally to send stuff up into space. It's just too much to ask for the current 
world conditions. We may see it eventually, but it, I think it'll be generations on. But we could see a one-way trip. I think people would volunteer for that, and that would be a little bit, I think, dark, but like, in the public eye, I think if, if people are, you know, making this noble sacrifice, um, unless people go crazy when they do that, like, I think people are gonna be supportive of it. Would anybody, would anybody here do a one-way trip to Mars? <laughs> Yeah, you're not gonna lack for volunteers. So, yeah, put your hand let's up. all go. Put your hand up. Party on Mars. The next party man is on Mars. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you guys very much. You got to um, do here. I have a question up in the sound booth. Yes, hi. Oh, so, your microphone works. It's fine. It's it's fine. No, so I'll preface this with saying I'm a layman, but I love science and the scientific method and all that shit. But I've had this thought in my mind for the past six months. Let's listen to Starcock. You guys probably don't know it or if you don't. And they're talking about dark energy and all that jazz. You guys had talked about it earlier. And I had the concept of, well, what if it is similar to water? Water is physical here. It's, it exists and all that shit. But at the edge of space, of known space rather, we don't know what's on the other side. What if the energy, for lack of a better term, is that negative pulling? Like in water, water literally pulls itself through the I don't know, I'm not a scientist, or a chemist, or anything like that, but it pulls water. You can siphon fuel out of your car because it begins going up. So if it's something similar to that, and I just can't stop thinking about it, is there anything, like I know it's unknown, but. Um, you're, you're not far off, actually. Um, that vacuum energy that Katie had mentioned is one of the solutions to this extra pressure was a thought and we wouldn't really know where it came from there are thoughts that maybe you could have extra dimensions where things could rely and it only interacts on very very small scales and we're not able to detect it in our detectors because it's it's happening there so this sort of vacuum energy pressure could be a thing and it could be sort of pulling it from another direction expanding our own universe can we measure that i don't know katie do you have further thoughts on that you have some on it great yeah, I'll give you the mic in a second if you want to say something else, Katie. But dark energy as a as a term is a lot is is actually I find it really misleading because it's not really a thing. There's not a, an an energy there that we can point to and say, oh, there that that's the energy. It's the expansion of space that's happening. That it's just a placeholder term that we use to say we don't know what's causing that, but it must be really energetic. It must be really powerful or something. But it's not like other forms of energy that we have. We don't know. That's why it's dark energy. <laughs> it's even more so than dark matter. We have a lot of evidence that dark matter is a thing that's there because we see the way that that galaxies move and things like that that don't line up with what all of the visible matter is doing. So there must be some invisible mass that's making gravity behave that way. That's one explanation, or Katie alluded to earlier, gravity might work differently on certain scales. We don't know for sure. The best ideas that we have are, it's a thing, it's there, we just can't see it, we don't know what it is, but dark energy is very different. It's a similar term, but but it's just a, a placeholder term for the expansion of space that we see as, like that's what's causing things to move apart. It's not pushing, it's just every, the space itself is, is what's expanding. Dark energy is really mysterious on a very deep cosmic fundamental level. Like we know that gravity exists and we know that the forces of the universe exist, but we don't know why we're all here and why it's exactly the way it is. You know, why is the gravitational constant the exact number that it is? We, we don't know that. And so on a very deep fundamental level, dark energy is this pressure, this expansion that we see just like how we see gravity pulls in and we just, we know that that's a law of the universe, we see this expansion pushing out. And just like how when you uh, are in the car and you push on the accelerator, you have to give it energy and give it gas to accelerate. The whole universe is accelerating. So we, we call it dark energy because we know there must be some uh, energy pushing on the accelerator for the universe, but it's on this very deeper fundamental level, just like how we try to understand how gravity is a fundamental force or how the how magnetism is a fundamental force. Dark energy is on that level where it's it's everywhere all at once and we don't know what is causing it at this very root level. Whereas dark matter, we're, we're much closer 
to figuring that out. We know about it a lot more than dark energy. And if you really want to blow your brain in this whole area, you don't even have to go that far because we're made of baryonic matter, right? And what is it? Is it 12? I forget the range. I, I can look 4%. everything up. Is it what? Is it 4%? 4, four, it's even worse. It's 4% of all the stars you see, all the art cars, all the playa people, uh, the dirt, the playa, everything that is matter, E equals MC squared, okay, energy equals mass times speed of light squared, energy equals mass, all of that, 4% of the entire universe is us. Carl Sagan said, the view into astronomy is a humbling experience. And so that's enough to blow your brain right there that we're only four percenters of this entire universe. All right, I think we're just about at time and I think that is a beautiful place to end off knowing that we are just 4% of this vast, beautiful, curious universe. Um, thank you so much for coming and asking some wonderful questions. Thank you so much to our panelists for your knowledge and your engagement, and uh, thank you so much for being here. We're excited to have you as uh, part of the observatory, part of Burning Man. I just want to make one final plug. If you like nerding out and talking about space and holding moon rocks and looking at Saturn's rings, you should definitely come visit us at 3 o'clock in G at the Black Rock Observatory. It's the big spinning observatory dome. You can't miss it. Um, we also have an me ongoing meteorite museum and solar observing right here, right at the end of the uh, right at center camp over there. And if you don't want to wait till night to do space stuff, come over here and join us. We're going to be doing that for the next hour or so. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Robin. Oh, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you, moderator. Woo! Thank you, Robin. Um, yeah, this has been really fun. Uh, it's really nice to be here in center camp and do some engagement and talk with all of you. So thanks a lot. Have a wonderful burn, and see you out there on the planet.